Okay. So, what are some of the physiological adjustments that need to be made when diving? This isn't a discussion of the mechanics of swimming or the energetic cost of swimming, although I will say <coughs> to survive at depth when, when you take a scuba apparatus with you, the energetic cost is greater with scuba than without. Or there's, um, what's the new model? Is it <coughs> snuba or something where you have the, the cans on the surface so you're not carrying the the cylinders with you underwater, but you have the pressurized delivery. Snuba? Is that what it stands yes. for? Or what does it stand for? It's like snorkel scuba. Snorkel scuba? Yeah. Maybe the snorkel too. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I looked at that a couple of years ago, but never pulled the trigger. Snuba. Snorkel <laughs> scuba. So in that situation, you're, you're closer to the energetic cost of just swimming. But having the extra weight obviously will increase the cost of swimming. Not only that, but breathing is harder. Given that you're breathing pressurized air through a regulator that's restrictive, it's taxing to move air and more so taxing than at sea level. It takes more force to inhale and exhale air through the regulator. The gas is generally more dense underwater than it is at sea level. And so you have this two-pronged uh, or three-pronged approach because the gas starts to condense even further as you progress deeper and it gets colder. So you have a restrictive flow valve, you have dense air, and air that gets even more <coughs> dense, progressively more dense, as you progress underwater. So overall, uh, a, an adjustment that needs to be made, other than the considerations with decompression sickness, and uh, pressure and, and gas changes are that the work of breathing increases um, as you progress underwater. The work of breathing, here it says due to increased dead space, and that's certainly the case with perhaps a snuba or even a, a snorkel. Um, dead space does increase somewhat here, but it's really only the volume occupied by um, the regulator. The work of breathing increases because of the restrictive flow valve and moving more dense air. And we can observe an increase in the work of breathing. The inspiratory work of breathing matched with the expiratory work of breathing. And you can see a pretty sharp difference in comparison to, well, we don't have um, a sea level control, but a very low resistance valve, which is essentially just a gutted regulator, breathing through that regulator. Is the, uh, is the control group with the black. And then you'll see um, breathing apparatus with just air, air from a normal cylinder like you would with a scuba apparatus versus um, a countermeasure that was being tested a while ago, Heliox, which is mostly helium with oxygen. The idea being that helium is lighter and easier to move and it helps alleviate some of that work of breathing uh, is shown here as well with the triangles and the dashed line. So what we're looking at is, as ventilation rates go up, so you're trying to force air through the, uh, the regulator more quickly, you're trying to move dense air more quickly, it's overall more taxing, and it's more obvious on the inspiratory side than the expiratory side. And it could be, we see this nice positive linear relationship where work of breathing goes up as ventilation goes up on the inspiratory side because you're always trying to fight not only the movement of air and the restrictive uh, regulator but also the pressure of the water around your body. You're inhaling and expanding your rib cage out into a, a pressurized environment and doing that really frequently at a high rate of ventilation is taxing. It's a lot of work. This is um, I wanted to say that was VO2, but that's not. Centimeters of, of H2O, per, H2O liters per minute. I have to check on what that actually means. Um, the, the work of breathing, normally it's measured in VO2 or, or as a percentage of, of VO2 max. 
would demonstrate the same relationship, goes up at higher ventilation rates. We don't see it as much on the expiratory side, and usually expiration is, is passive, unless you're exercising at a really high intensity. It's the recoil of the rib cage and the return to a normal state of the diaphragm. It's passive. And here we have the assistance of the surrounding water. The pressure around you will help push air out, but even still it seems that moving dense air adds a bit of extra work, whereas alleviating that, uh, that density by having that, that helium mixture um, somewhat improves that work of breathing. But overall, normal scuba requires much more trained and much more work involved from the uh, respiratory muscles to simply move air and breathe underwater. So that's one adjustment that needs to be made, but the, uh, the health-related complications are in trauma associated with pressure. So that would affect your ability to um, endure or, or, or dive for long periods of time. It would, it would reflect your endurance underwater, your ability to oxidize fat during a, a cycle race or something. But health-related complications aren't due to changes in work of breathing. They're not due to changes in the, the mode of activity. Health-related complications are due to trauma associated with rapid changes in pressure. Now, in theory, if you could change pressure rapidly enough, according to Boyle's law, it could be deadly because those finite air-filled spaces can only expand so far as you move back to the surface. If you're breathing normally, you can usually avoid this. But if you've been breathing and you hold your breath foolishly as you rise to the surface, there's no avenue for the air in your lungs to escape. And as the pressure lessens as you ascend, the air in your lungs starts to expand and take up more and more volume. There's only so much volume into which your lungs can expand, at which point you might endure some kind of rupture or rip or tear that compromises normal lung function. So certainly, breath holding as you ascend is, is not advised. Just the increase from 10 meters underwater to, uh, to sea level doubles lung volume. If you have full lungs, 6 liters of air in your lungs, you're trying to fit 12 liters into that same space as you emerge from the water. Not advised. Rupture of the tissue, the physical barotrauma, and that, that's really the difference between these two concepts. Barotrauma would be physical rupture due to changes in, in volume, changes in air volume. We'll talk about decompression sickness on the next slide, but it's changes in, uh, in individual constituent gases, not a physical rupture, but the movement of gases that causes problems. So rupture of lung tissue in a situation where you breath hold obviously um, allows blood into the alveoli and all the airways. It allows air into the pulmonary circulation and then to the arterial side. Um, which is dangerous for gas exchange in the capillary beds. It's really dangerous as those air bubbles um, are transferred to the cerebrospinal fluid in the brain. And as soon as gas exchange and nutrients are limited in the brain, seizure, stroke, death, unconsciousness. You should probably list unconsciousness before death as a progression. So barotrauma is a physical... Uh, a physical consequence of rapid changes in, in pressure and the corresponding rapid changes in volume. These can generally be avoided by not holding your breath. Decompression sickness, on the other hand, still can be avoided, but it takes purposeful effort to avoid decompression sickness. If barotrauma was a trauma related to improper uh, use or consideration of Boyle's Law. Decompression sickness is a disease or disorder 
corresponding to an improper adherence to Henry's law. Decompression sickness results from rapid uh, expansion of gases and then the release of dissolved gases from the blood or other fluid-filled tissues in the body. Decompression sickness results from the release of those individual gases that had been dissolved in the body. Specifically, nitrogen. Because nitrogen is the only gas that is modifiable by the changes in pressure we'd experience. CO2 is going to dissolve. O2 is not going to dissolve. Nitrogen might dissolve or it might not. It's fickle. Mild decompression sickness causes obvious rashes at the surface of the skin, some minor vascular trauma that looks like a rash, uh, joint pain as gas bubbles accumulate between bones in the joints. You can see them in the knees. Um, between the, the vertebrae, it causes you to, to hunch over and was referred to affectionately as the bend because it made you bend over and you were aching and it was really uncomfortable as that gas emerged from the, the fluid-filled spaces on return to land. And you can even see it in this picture here. This black arrow is pointing to some gas bubbles in the cerebrospinal fluid uh, surrounding the brain. So these are dissolved gas bubbles of nitrogen that had come out of solution upon being depressurized. It's analogous to the idea of uh, you have a bottle of cola and you shake it up and you, you open it. Or you, a bottle of champagne when you celebrate a big victory and you take the cork off and it explodes. All that gas rushes out of solution in that case. Not from a change in pressure, but it's, it's agitation that forces that gas out. This is very similar. You're essentially shaking your body by coming to the surface and that gas rushes out. It would be neat to do an in-class demonstration of that one day, but it seems a little foolish to make such a mess just to get that one point across. So mild decompression sickness, some release of fluids that accumulates in the body, but you can normally deal with it. This might, you might need to uh, go to the hospital or, or rest afterwards, but it's not uh, terrible. That gas will eventually be dispelled from the body through the lungs. But more severe decompression sickness, and this, this would be severe. This image is fairly severe. This amount of, uh, of bubbles in the vasculature is pretty severe. Because dizziness, paralysis, vertigo, hallucinations, uh, chest pain, a whole, whole host of different factors that could cause you to collapse. And if you're collapsing in a situation underwater, it can uh, probably pretty, be pretty threatening. This was, um, this was first tested in, in vipers, in snakes. Robert Boyle of Boyle's Law just had a bunch of snakes that he was, he was testing, and he would pressurize them and, and depressurize them, and he could see uh, the appearance of bubbles in the tears or on the eyes of these snakes, which I guess there weren't as many uh, ethical review boards that you had to go by, or maybe just no one liked snakes back in those days. But... Um, that's where we first observed this phenomenon and then led him to uh, contribute to his pressure volume um, rules. So decompression sickness, the emergence of gas from tissues in the blood, might look something like this, might be disruptive in, uh, in this sense, where it creates arterial gas embolisms. That is, bubbles of air on the arterial side. Bubbles of air on the arterial side specifically disrupt blood flow. And so the disruption of blood flow on the arterial side, you're thinking, is probably not good. Arterial blood flow is really important to supply oxygen and nutrients to tissues that need it. If you're disrupting that blood flow, those tissues don't get the nutrients they need. Now... Gas embolisms are, luckily, much more common on the venous side. That is, they're produced much more commonly on the venous side. So we have the opportunity to get rid of them 
as they pass through the lungs. They can either pass through the venous system, through the heart, mix with the blood, and then at the lungs get expelled. If they pass through the capillaries, though, and that air bubble stays in the vasculature, it goes from being a venous gas embolism, or a VGE, to an arterial gas embolism, AGE, which becomes a lot more um, problematic. The venous gas embolisms are more common. We can expel the large majority at the lungs, but if any pass through to the arterial side, that's where they become problematic. Small bubbles might not be much of an issue, but as soon as they start to combine and form larger bubbles, then the, the uh, hydrostatic pressure will seal off the vessel, essentially, and prevent blood flow. And a lot of the time, they'll get um, caught in these junctures where the bifurcations of the arteries make smaller and smaller branches, and the air bubble's not dividing. The air bubble just gets lodged. Um, in these areas, blocking off all subsequent blood flow. So the downstream tissue then is damaged, is affected. And in mild senses, you have the pictures on, um, online, but I'll show you the, the surface rashing of the body coming up. The, uh, the mild cases result in damage to the, the downstream tissue as such. So this would be no delivery of nutrients, hypoxia, or um, withholding of nutrients from these tissues, and rupture or death of tissues at the, the skin. This is a superficial rashing caused by decompression sickness. You can see something similar in individuals here, where um, not only do we have rashing, but the, uh, the accumulation of gas between the joints is actually pushed apart. These are finger joints. Yeah, they don't look like knees. It's certainly not a, a femur. Pushed apart the joints, so there's a, an air-filled space here that would cause some minor joint pain, cause minor joint stretch, and in uh, severe cases might cause you to um, not use the joint or not apply pressure to the joint. And so in attempts then to limit decompression sickness, how would we ever adjust for this? On the barotrauma side, it's easy. Don't hold your breath. Breathe frequently as you go up, and the air volume in your lungs will normalize. How do we get a around the idea that nitrogen will dissolve into the fluid of the body? It will happen more as you go deeper, less as you remain shallow, but it's going to dissolve regardless. So when you emerge, it's released. How do we deal with that? Luckily, we've talked a lot about the physical properties of gases. And as a physical process, you can calculate how much gas, specifically nitrogen, will be dissolved in a tissue for the depth and duration of the dive. This is what make up uh, what's called dive tables. And you know exactly how much gas needs to be removed from the body on ascent. This differs based on individual characteristics, like anything. Um, your body composition, so fat tends to uh, retain nitrogen longer, and therefore the effects of decompression sickness might persist longer, or there might be a greater volume of nitrogen to be released. Um, starting altitude, if you're in the Andes and you dive in a mountaintop pool, then the, the change in pressure is a lot different. You're subject to pressure of the water, but you started from uh, a hypoxic or hypobaric condition. The change is greater, so that can worsen the, uh, the movement of nitrogen into the body. Um, genetic conditions. Uh, patent Foreman ovale. Remember this from uh, A&P? Foreman ovale was the, uh, the space between the atria that was open as a fetus that allowed circulation of blood from the venous to the arterial side, so the fetus didn't need to breathe, didn't need to send blood to the lungs, which is good because they're underwater too. But that seals up 
after birth in a situation where that hasn't sealed, that's a really easy route for venous gas embolisms to become arterial gas embolisms. So people with that condition are a lot more susceptible to negative side effects of decompression sickness. So modifying factors included there that can worsen the symptoms, but overall, taking those into account, we can calculate how much gas should come out of uh, fluids on ascent. We can observe it, and I didn't... Oh. I didn't take, uh, take stock of the, the picture in the back as we started here, but this is a Doppler assessment of gas embolisms in the heart. You can see uh, a larger number on the right heart on the venous side, a lower number on the left side, the arterial side. So a lot of these little gas bubbles are being released through the lungs, which is good, but there are a couple little spots as, uh, as you leave on the arterial side. We can visualize, and this is a Doppler visualization, of blood returning to the lungs to see if the uh, strategy was successful. You can see it in, uh, in tears, in, in fluids that are secreted from the body as well. But obviously, you want to avoid that if you can. We're not going to talk about dive tables or figure out how much nitrogen needs to be released. but. Um, a good example of a strategy to mitigate the negative side effects of decompression sickness is in deep dives, where the idea of adapting back to surface pressures is taken to the extreme. So prolonged dives at a really deep depth over four atmospheres, so 40 meters or lower, or, or diving 40 meters or, or further down than 40 meters into the water, um, are associated not only with a higher risk of decompression sickness, but also a whole host of other neurological symptoms. Uh, loss of memory, um, uncoordination, intoxication, uh, euphoria, in a process that's called inert gas narcosis. The, uh, the heavy noble gases of which nitrogen is one, helium is another. Um, the noble gases can be narcotic at high pressures. And as you proceed down into the depths at high pressures, you can reach a point where nitrogen causes hallucinations, has narcotic effects. And so... Um, yeah, over four atmospheres, seven to ten causes memory problems, problems with consciousness, reduced physical sensations. Cousteau referred to it as the rapture of the deep, as we see here. Um, so, so nitrogen, being a slightly heavier molecule, is more likely to cause these effects. As of late, a lot of the, uh, the filler gas in scuba tanks has been replaced by helium. It's a, it's a lighter, noble gas that doesn't have these narcotic effects. Um, and we think that the, the reason for this is with the movement of this gas into fluid-filled spaces of the body, that it might somehow accumulate around the nerves, the synapses between nerves, or the synapses between nerve and muscle, or uh, between nerves in the brain, and then cause or disrupt normal signal transmission, which is really what nar narcosis is, altering the... Uh, the signal transmission, the pattern, the frequency, the, the extent of those signals in, uh, in a normal situation, which is this point here. So, um, so these longer deep dives are generally short-lived. They need to return back to the surface quickly or, or, or frequently, and in doing so, they'll often encounter situations of decompression sickness where that dissolved gas needs to be dissipated or mitigated. So how is this accomplished? One way is through decompression stops. D 
decompression stops. Decompression stops are literally stopping your ascent at predetermined intervals as you emerge from the surface. So from four atmospheres, you might stop at three atmospheres for half an hour. At two atmospheres for half an hour. At one atmosphere and so on and so forth allowing yourself time to equilibrate to that new lower pressure for some nitrogen to be released and for you to blow off that extra gas that was stored in the fluid-filled tissues of the body. Another way There are two other ways, really. Another way would be to pressurize the individual as they uh, went down um, on their long, deep saturation dive. So a situation like this might be one that you use for um, like oil refinery workers, deep sea drillers, things like that, where, where work needs to be done underwater. Um, transatlantic cable maintenance, something like that. Uh, maybe the job isn't long, maybe it's, it's a, a quick descent underwater but to deep pressures and you can take essentially a, a bubble of sea level pressure with you to avoid having to adapt that new deep pressure and then uh, decompress on the way back up. So gradual decompression using, using decompression stops. <laughs> Don't ever compress in the first place using uh, specialized suits like this. Or if you've gone to really deep depths, what some uh, individuals will often do is if they're not completely decompressed when they come up, there are special canisters on the surface of the boat whenever they're in the, out doing work on the ocean that are pressurized. And so they'll bring the individual out of the water, we'll put them in this chamber, and they'll stay pressurized and gradually decompress on the surface in this artificial capsule. So the main idea is the gradual reacclimation to lower pressures, either doing it um, in, in situ as you uh, leave the water, not decompressing in the first place, or having a a separate capsule on the surface of the boat that allows you to mimic being underwater and um, travel back home to your port of entry while decompressing. Now there's really only a couple points left in four minutes. I'm going to skip over a couple of the exercise slides, but I do want to show you one of them because um, there's some interesting information that can be gleaned from this. But it seems, at least in rats, which is this, uh, this pilot study, that exercise can reduce the formation of bubbles. There's different ways to assess the grade or the severity or the volume of gas bubbles that are released after decompression. The size of them, the number of them, uh, using Doppler to, to count the number of bubbles. Um, different scores and this is one of them that's, um, I think it's on a seven-point scale. Anyways, exercise versus sedentary. We see exercise prior to being compressed protects against bubble formation, but only at this really narrow window of 20 hours in this case. Two days beforehand, the effects are lost. A day-ish beforehand, and we see this protection, lower severity of the bubble score, and then as you get closer and closer, the exercise has, again, less and less effect. But prior exercise reduces gas bubble formation and improves survivability of these rats. So this is more extreme pressure. These rats were decompressed to 700 kPa for 45 minutes. And I don't know what that is in millimeters of mercury offhand. Um, Pretty severe compression. Survival was improved 20 hours with exercise 20 hours prior, and we think this is due to the nitric oxide effects of exercise, the uh, vasodilation associated with exercise, and, um, and the, the uh, 
persistent or residual mechanisms of having nitric oxide circulating in the blood. 20 hours of exercise, or 20 hours prior to diving only, there are striking effects. And we're not exactly sure why it's that time point specifically. We've done this in humans. 18 hours seems to also confer benefits, and we can observe it with Doppler imagery of the heart, just like we did on that last slide. A much, uh, much reduced appearance of bubbles. Somehow this window seems to really be ideal for reducing the severity of decompression sickness and improving survivability. So I just want you to take that away, and we'll summarize quickly so we don't have to come back next Thursday and, and do it. Um, let me just toss all of these up here so you can frantically copy them all down before class is done. But we covered a lot of information on the physics of diving and what makes diving interesting or difficult from a physiological point of view. You don't have access to air underwater, so you need to take it with you. And when you take it with you, you breathe at the environmental or surrounding pressure. And it's that characteristic that is unique stress of this environment and causes problems. Breathing air at the ambient or surrounding pressure will change the volume of air that you're taking in and the solubility of individual gases that you're taking in. Those change progressively as you move deeper and deeper. And if you were to remove yourself from depth quickly, problems arise where all of a sudden the air expands, causes barotrauma, ripping, tearing of air-filled spaces in the body, causes trauma uh, in decompression sickness where the dissolved gas is released quickly from the body if you uh, ascend too quickly. The countermeasures seem to isolate the individual, either making them gradually return to a normal pressure or taking them out of that situation or not putting them in that situation in the first place. And we seem to have some protective effect of exercise at that oddly specific 24-hour pre-dive time point. So just a quick primer on diving. The antithesis of hypoxia and hypobaria We'll leave it at that for today. We can come back and maybe do a brief overall summary of the course on Thursday or review session after we have our, um, our third and final presentation. But next week, you are up. You are leading the discussions starting Tuesday bright and early at 9.45. I'm excited. All right, have a great weekend.